All right. What do you guys say? Yeah, we should get started. Um, so, so I guess thanks everybody for coming for, for our next session here of our Comaral seminar series. Uh, we're excited. There's a bunch of cool talk that we have planned for this next session. Um, that yeah, you can look in the website for all the details of the upcoming talks. Um, so you probably already have that information, but you can check it out. We can post a link as well. Um, and this is hosted with Marta, Shaigun, Franz, and Carl. Carl can't be here today. And we have uh, Robert Lofton, who's also helping us now for this new session as well. Um, to remind people or to tell new people the plan for, for this uh, talk, right, is that um, uh, Marta's going to give the talk today. But then people, keep yourselves on mute unless you have uh, questions. If you have questions like clarifying questions, you can put those directly in the chat. Um, and then we can try and interrupt uh, and, and ask those clarifying questions. If you have questions for the end, you can try and be fancy and hit this button with the different shapes and click on the Q&A button and then try and ask, put a question there where they can be um, uh, asked at the end of the talk as well. You can also put questions in the, in the chat if you uh, want to be less fancy too. Um, so then uh, that's the, the plan for the, the talk. Um, and today, as I was alluding to, uh, we're going to have a talk from one of our very own, uh, Marta Garnello. Uh, she is a, a senior research scientist, I believe, at uh, Google DeepMind. Um, and um, she's been there since she gradu graduated from Imperial College London in 2017, I believe. Um, and she's worked on lots of, uh, lots of different uh, cool stuff over that time, um, mm -hmm. including uh, uh, generative models for uh, more efficient learning using deep uh, neural nets, um, as well as multi-agent reinforcement learning, which he's going to talk about today, um, game theoretic related stuff, applications for bio and medicine related things. We're very excited to hear about um, some of her multi-agent work that she's going to talk about uh, in this seminar. So go ahead, take it away, Marta. Thanks a lot, Chris. Um, hi, everyone. As Chris mentioned, my name is Marta. Um, it's actually really exciting to be on this side of the organizational comedy. Normally, I'm like watching out that the streaming on YouTube works and that we don't get any interruptions. So today is, is a bit more chill on that end. Um, and as Chris mentioned, um, I've done a few different things around uh, DeepMind, um, but I also worked um, on multi-agent and I actually worked also related to Timothy Shagan. Um, and in that time, I, there were a few takeaways that, that I thought were interesting um, that I'd like to share with you guys today. Um, and some of these slides, if anyone watched, we had a NeurIPS tutorial last year. Some of these are reused and then some are the like key insights, I think, and some summarizing um, around how uh, training multi-agent, how it changes when you go from single agent to multi-agent. Um, and so as a beginning, training agents, when I first joined DeepMind, DeepMind does a lot of uh, RL training. Um, it was clear that we were very good as a field also training single uh, RL agents on single player games. Um, so very famously, we had Atari, where you can see here we have a policy that acts in some environment, a game like Atari, for example. Um, and part of the reason that this was uh, that we're so good at it, and this is so simple, um, is for once that the environment is self-contained. So this was a game that we could just throw our one agent into. Um, but also this notion of absolute reward. I think I took it for granted when I first started thinking about RL, but actually this is a very useful notion to have, to have an absolute value that everyone across the globe can measure themselves against. Uh, any lab can report their um, their uh, score and, and this is all comparable. Um, so foolishly enough then I thought why not multi-agent that sounds like it just would be more interesting and should be just e just as easy. Um, however when uh, when you move from single agents to multi-agent there's a, fun a few fundamental things that change. Um, uh, let's take the game of chase for example ch uh, chess which is a two-player game um, and the first thing that's out the window is this notion of having a self-contained environment. Um, so all of a sudden now we require an opponent to play. Um, and we're not even making statements with whether this is a good or bad opponent, just the fact that this is not something that your agent can play on its own. Um, and you need to find that agent, that other opponent from somewhere, right? Um, but also this notion of absolute reward, which is a very valuable thing, is also doesn't hold any longer, right? So all of a sudden our performance can only be measured relative to someone else's. Um, so we only really have these pairwise comparisons in the case of two player games, for example. Um, and these two quite fundamentally change the game a little bit. Um, in addition to this, um, I also made the mistake of then started to look at environments that 
displayed a lot of very non non-transitive behavior. Um, so just as a catch up, a game is transitive or a game of skill when there is a very clear notion of um, a player, if A pleads B and, uh, and B pleads C, uh, beats C, then A is going to be C as well. Um, so there's a very clear axis along with which we can rank agents, right? Um, and single player agents uh, are transitive because you are, you have these absolute performances, you have the score, and then you can line everyone along that score. And, and, and that makes life quite easy. Whereas the moment you start looking at multiplayer, you have this, uh, you have the, you are, as I mentioned, you're comparing uh, in the play, in the case of two players, you are comparing pair worth performances between all of the pairs of uh, agents of players that you, that you might have. Um, and that lead, uh, and because of there are these multiple comparisons, you can have cycles, right? So now you can have these non-transitive dynamics. Um, and this makes learning in such a game very hard because you can get in, stuck in those uh, cycles. There's not anymore a very clear direction that we want to optimize for. All of a sudden, it's not even clear which direction do we want to learn in. Um, so this is another element um, that I think, um, yeah, made multi-agent training very hard. Um, so to summarize, firstly, we needed an opponent that, that we have uh, in order to train our agents. Uh, we can only really measure our performance in relation to someone else's performance. Uh, and on top of that, we are likely to run into some cyclic non-transitive dynamics as we're training, all of which are big challenges that I don't know that we have an answer for as of today yet, actually. Um, so then the question when we started looking into this was like, how can one even start thinking about training agents under these conditions, right? Um, and one of the things that people often do, um, or one, one very common solution to this is to think about self-play. Um, so here we have a little agent, and what does it mean to self-play is um, you take your agent and you just pick a copy and stick both of those into your two-player environment, um, and you just have it train against itself. Um, it is good in that it does provide, it solved the first problem, so we do now have an opponent, uh, which also, one has to add, is about your level. So that's actually quite nice. You don't have an opponent that's going to crash you or someone that is not interesting to learn with. It is on par with you, by definition. <laughs> um, however, it is also clear that it, it, there is no real sense of what your progress is because you are playing against yourself. So you could be, and you have no other real comparison, so you don't know how well you're doing in that game. Um, so that notion is, is gone, unfortunately. Um, and in the case of these non-transitive games, which in multiplayer games is often the case, um, you might st get stuck in cycles, right? So you're, if you have a rock, paper, scissors, you could get stuck in that loop, some rock, paper, scissors-like interactions. You could just find yourself stuck in there rather than improving as along some other more transitive kind of dimension. So while self-play makes sense, and it has been super useful, a lot of like big successes, including StarCraft, build on, uh, build on this. Um, it does not solve all of the issues that we, that we mentioned earlier. So if you take self-play one step further, uh, rather than thinking, can I play just against a copy of myself? Another idea that people very commonly use is to just use entire populations of agents. So rather than playing against one, we now have a whole collection of agents, um, and people sometimes train them one at a time or the whole population at once. Um, and this does, to a certain extent, um, uh, address the issues that we mentioned. So as we mentioned, we do have an opponent, we do require an opponent, and this does provide loads of opponents, so that's really good. Um, I guess the question that comes in here is, well, maybe those are not good opponents. How can we make sure that our population actually has a good set of opponents that we can learn from? Um, as we said before, the performance still can only really be measured in relation to opponents. So this is something that we're not going to change by applying population. Um, we can, however, have a somewhat good estimate of our performance if our population that we're measuring our performance against spans the space well, right? If we can say, oh, this population covers most of the strategies, then we can say, how good is our agent against all strategies? And therefore, we do have some sort of more absolute notion about how that uh, particular agent is doing. Um, but that implies that we do need the population to be diverse enough to actually uh, evaluate against. Um, and finally, as we mentioned, we have these non-transitive game dynamics. Um, here, having a population is particularly helpful because with a population, we can actually cover different strategies. So whereas with one agent, if there are several winning strategies, with one agent, we can only really cover one at a time. Whereas with a population, we can make sure that we're actually uh, covering all of the different strategies. And I guess the challenge here, again in purple, 
is that we don't really have a guarantee of finding all of these valuable strategies, right? We have the, the, we have the ability, um, but there's no guarantee. Um, so a lot of the ideas and thoughts that, uh, that we had in DeepMind around this was how to tackle these questions. So on one hand, how do we think about evaluating agents? Uh, how even this very basic notion, which for me was a given coming from single agent RL. Um, and then once we know how to evaluate agents, how do we get to good, uh, to good strong populations of agents? And we did all of this in the context of agent populations. Um, so for this presentation, this was a bit of a motivation. Uh, for this motivation, a presentation, um, I'm gonna cover the following questions. It's a bit of an overview over what the community has done in this, in this um, area. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about how we thought about it. Um, but first we'll start at how do you, uh, can, how can you evaluate? So this question of evaluating and comparing in a population, but at an individual level. So if I have an agent, how can I even start to think about how good it is versus another agent? Um, and then once we thought about that at an individual level, um, how can I rate entire population? So maybe I have a whole population that I want to compare against someone else's uh, population. Um, and then finally, we'll get to the topic of, okay, we now maybe hope that we have some sort of way of, of uh, evaluating our agents. Now, how do we actually get them in the first place? How can we train uh, strong populations of agents? So I'll start with evaluating individual um, agents in multiplayer games. The question, as I mentioned, is how can we rate our policy high when there is no notion of absolute performance? We're only ever relative to each other, right? Um, and um, just to set the setting, we're gonna have we're gonna look at two player games, and we're gonna have policy one, we have policy two, um, and for each of the games, we're gonna have some performances. We're gonna call them P in the in the future notation. Um, so, what does it mean to be able to evaluate our agents? Well, one thing we can do is we can try to predict the performances of our agents, um, or another thing is to rank, since we can not rate at least maybe that is a comparative uh, way of evaluating our agents. And I guess the most famous one that I'm sure most of you are very familiar with is the ELO rating system, which has been used uh, for, for ranking many, many uh, two-player games. Um, basically, what the ELO model does is it is uh, modeling the outcome of a game between two players. So basically, what is the probability that player one beats player two based on their ELO rating? So this ELO number, magical ELO number, which we'll come to in a second how that's updated. Um, and essentially it has this, this uh, sigmoid-like function, as you can see there, um, that just uh, describes the probability of one agent beating the other and is described by the equation at the bottom. Um, and actually the way that you calculate these ELO numbers is basically for each of the player, you start with some sort of rating and then every time you observe an actual match, you update your uh, ELO based, uh, you update based on like the difference between what you would have predicted for that outcome and the actual outcome of the game. So it's a uh, very simple um, update. Um, and this already gets us a, a long way and it's very widely used because again, we, uh, it allows us to compare uh, players in different two pl uh, player settings. However, there's some downsides to it as well. Um, so first of all, it doesn't deal super well with uh, teams. So if you have a team, uh, then it's going to assume that all of the policies are independent from each other. Uh, so you cannot really, it doesn't allow for including some sort of team notion. Um, it also only works for two player games, which is uh, you know, not great. Um, one of the key problems, I guess, is that it model that it assumes that the underlying game is transitive. And as we said, in two player games or multiplayer games, it is quite common actually, or is to almost to be expected that there will be some some non transitivities, right? So this is a very strong assumption to make. Um, and finally, all the updates are treated equal. So um, regardless of how close or not a game must what game match was or how much uncertainty we had over it, this is all treated the same. Um, and there have been some extensions around ELO that have tried to address some of these, so uh, it's not the end on deal. Uh, there was MMR, which was used for, uh, uh, well, it's used in StarCraft. Um, and what this uh, does is that includes a notion of uncertainty. So if you have a lower uncertainty over someone's ELO or someone's, I guess, MMR ranking, um, then the update will be slower, which makes sense, right? If at the beginning you don't know if someone's good or not, then that can fluctuate more. Whereas if you're more certain, you should maybe move it a little bit less. Um, there is Glico for chess, um, which again also takes uncertainty estimate uh, into, into account. And in this particular case, actually, these uncertainty estimates are a function 
of time. So uh, the longer it has been since you played, the higher the uncertainty. Um, and then finally, I'm sure some gamers might know True Skill from Microsoft uh, that uses it for Xbox, um, which is a bit uh, more of a complex one actually, which has full on Bayesian message passing uh, to like estimate the the little uh, the skill estimates of, of the different players. Um, so in spirit, these are all very similar, and again, they're trying to to rank the different agents uh, and allow us to compare them to each other. Um, However, one of the things, and this is some part of the research uh, that uh, also Dave did at, at DeepMind and we worked on with him, um, was that uh, these uh, metrics of FAR didn't take into account the cyclical nature of some of the games. Um, they assumed that uh, there is going to be a transitive dimension of skill, um, while we would like some ratings that actually do take into account these cycles. Um, also, we're going to now focus on rating actually, not ranking, because if you have a cycle, actually ranking often becomes meaningless because there was no like axes along which you can uh, rank people. Uh, so we're just going to rate <laughs> agents. Um, and this is where actually game theory came in. It was quite interesting. There were a, a few different ideas floating around how you could do that. Um, a very straightforward, but maybe not very good idea could be to just use the Nash support as a rating. Um, so the Nash support, if you have a payoff table between all of the agents, that is mean pi and pi, um, that basically gives you the, the, the outcome, the probability of one beating the other, um, we can calculate the Nash uh, distribution um, using this payoff matrix that gives you how much weight you should play uh, in Nash equilibrium if you were to choose a mixture of all of these uh, agents. Um, and one could argue that you could use this distribution uh, the weights of this distribution as some sort of um, rating for each of the agents, right? So if an agent has a high Nash uh, uh, support, then it should, it, that could be a high rating. Um, however, it's not a great method, uh, overall bad, um, because if so, those of you that are, have calculated Nash from payoffs, usually most of the time, a lot of the entries are zero, so that doesn't give you a very good way of com uh, comparing. Um, what's nice, it does take into account non-point sensitivity, so we'll give, give uh, the Nash distribution back. Um, there is, of course, alpha rank, which is uh, by, uh, we have Shagan and, and Carl as well here, um, where um, it's uh, more sophisticated. So again, we have this payoff table. And what, uh, what you're going to do is, instead of uh, just calculating the Nash, um, you just uh, have, um, uh, you, uh, have every of the uh, agents be a state of a mark of transition uh, model. And, and then you use that transition matrix to calculate a stationary distribution. Um, so basically, where would you end up if the payoff was some sort of micro transition model? Um, and then that stationary distribution can give you more of an insight of what, what are the stronger players um, in, in that population. Um, what's really good about alpha rank is that it does consider as with Nash the non-sensitivities. It is faster to compute than Nash because Nash does uh, usually involve solving. Uh, problems um, and it also is, it had several other applications it was used for clustering and other different downstream tasks as well so it's not just for um, rating um, as you can see on, uh, on the well on the, on the left there is a table it has been used to rank uh, alpha zero and other different agents that are trained on the same game and then just compared their uh, different performances with each other um, what happens with, uh, with alpha rank is that uh, there can be many entries with zeros. Um, however, unlike Nash, um, you can actually regulate how many of these you have because there is this, and that's where the alpha comes in the name from, the alpha hyperparameter. So you can play around with that and that'll uh, uh, let you put more or less weight on the end of the tail. Um, another variation actually, and this is uh, yeah, that Dave worked on as well, um, is this notion of uh, MELA, multidimensional ELA. Um, so again, we've talked about transitive games versus non-transitive games. Uh, transitive being those that have a clear uh, axis of skill that uh, can be clearly optimized along non-transitive, those that have some cyclical component to it. Um, and if we look at the definition of ELA, so at the bottom, that's just the, the equation that I showed earlier, how you calculate ELO, essentially what you're doing there is you're taking the difference between the two ELO ratings, right? Um, and the difference is inherently just a very transitive measure, right? You're just saying on this axis, what's the difference between those two? Um, and this is the reason, by the way, that ELO only really captures uh, transitive skills. So one extension of this that you could think of 
um, is to basically take almost the same as ELO. So we again still have this is the same as you had in ELO, but you add this extra component over here that allows you to capture any other interaction. So cyclical interaction, for example. So it's this, uh, in this particular case, it was this matrix um, um, omega that has this fixed form. Um, and then you have these C vectors that you're learning, just like you would learn the ELO ratings. Um, so essentially you are not only learning ELO now, you're learning ELO and those Cs. Um, but these Cs give, are expressive enough that they allow you to capture interactions that they're beyond just taking the difference like in this, uh, like in this part over here. Um, and MELO actually worked great uh, for games that do have um, non-transitivities in them. So over here on the left, we have the results for estimating, for ELO estimating the performance of uh, three agents on uh, the same uh, AlphaGo, I think it is, and on Go. Um, and then here is the empirical value so that you can read this as the ground truth. And this is what multidimensional ELO predicts. So as you can see, we want to be close to these values and multidimensional ELO does a much better job at actually getting close to these values compared to regular ELO. And the argument is that this is because it allows in this extra term to actually uh, account for much more complex interactions between the agents than just this one minus the other, which is very, very transitive. Cool. So this was a very quick overview <laughs> over how you would go about um, estimating the performance of agents or how people think about estimating performance of a single agent against any other agent whenever you have a multiplayer game. Um, but since we're dealing with populations, another of the questions that popped up is how do we go about comparing entire populations? So it's not anymore about how good is this agent. It's more if I have a population of agents that I've trained and someone else has a different population, which one of those two is better? And the thing is that we can combine, we can take mixtures of all of the agents in our populations, right? So this does give us a lot of expressivity, but also how do you then go about comparing those mixtures? Um, yeah. So the first measure that, uh, and this is a paper that we introduced back in the day, uh, it was called effective diversity. Um, and the goal of this measure is to um, uh, evaluate how well the policies in our population cover the strategy space um, of our game. Um, so the little caveat, caveat as well is we don't care just about diversity of strategies, but we would like there to be diverse and good strategies. So we want to have a strong and diverse set of strategies. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, one of the tools that we're going to use, we're going to have a payoff matrix uh, of the population. Um, and uh, also from that, we're going to calculate the Nash distribution. Uh, for this particular population, actually, we uh, for this particular measure, the effective diversity, we only are comparing actually we, we calculated with the payoff matrix of our population against itself, because that will give us an absolute value for diversity, which we can then compare to other populations as well. So our payoff matrix is gonna be our population against itself. Um, and the way you can go about calculating the effective diversity is actually very simple. Given a payoff matrix and the Nash, which basically says, um, given that my population has to play itself, what are the best agents it would put forward to play itself basically? Um, the effective diversity is just the matrix product of like this payoff, the, the absolute values of this payoff and the Nash. Now, a little intuition about what all of this means. Um, imagine you have a very small Nash support, meaning only one of the agents is really strong, the other ones are not really good. Uh, when you multiply these matrices together, this is essentially, essentially gonna get lost in, in that process. So your diversity is gonna be very small versus if your Nash support of winning strategies is somewhat distributed when you are carrying out this multiplication. And again, we're only looking at the absolute value. So there is no canceling out through like the, the symmetry of the matrix and the payoff matrix. Um, then you will still, these values are gonna give you a higher uh, diversity. So essentially the question you're asking here is how spread out is the set of strong strategies in my population? That was the first measure that we kind of introduced. And then the second was the relative population performance. Um, so again, as before, because we're in a two player game, we can only really determine the performance of our population relative to either another player or in this particular case, a population level relative to a second population. 
So whereas for the diversity, we were only comparing our own diversity and then this value can be compared to other populations themselves. Now we actually have two populations and we're gonna have a, a payoff matrix between our population and whatever other population we wanna evaluate against. And that's this purple versus this pink. Um, and this measure is actually very similar to the effective diversity one and it works in similar ways. So if we have this payoff between the two uh, uh, populations, we're gonna get the Nash for each of those, right? So um, uh, in yeah, both of the Nash uh, distributions and we're just gonna take the product between the Nash's and the payoff. Um, so as an intuition, what you're saying is how well would one population do if it put forward the best agents it has against population two, assuming that population two is also putting the best agents against population one. So best case for both, and then multiply that with the payoff. So the actual outcome, how well are we doing? Um, and this is quite an intuitive way of comparing performances of, of populations. And this is something that we've been using as well um, when comparing different populations of agents in our work. Um, cool. Mm. So all so far was more along the lines of how do we go about evaluating agents when we don't have this absolute measure for performance. Um, now that we have some notion of how we can evaluate that, how do we now train? So now comes the interesting part where we want to train these populations. Uh, we haven't even gotten there yet. Um, so where do these come from uh, in the first place, essentially? Um, um, okay, so as a catch up, we want to train a policy pi on, let's say, a two player game for now, D. Um, because we're going to have this two player game, not only is the reward a function of pi, but also of its environment, of its opponent as well. So, as we said earlier, we need an opponent at the very least to play against us if we're training. Um, so one option, um, which is usually done when we think about population training, is um, to train against this population of pre-trained. We have we assume we have some pre-trained population of agents, and then we're going to pick an opponent from there. Um, and I guess the natural questions that come from this is, where is this pre-trained population coming from in the first place? Um, to which the answer is often, you can build it up iteratively. So we'll go through a lot of these methods that do these. Um, but what people usually do is you maybe start at random and then you keep adding stronger and stronger population um, agents to your population. Um, and then how do we pick the right opponent, right? To like train against once we have this set of agents. Um, and there are different heuristics that we'll also have a little look about, but this is actually not a trivial question at all. Um, so most of these methods actually can be seen a, as, a, as a way of PSRO, which stands for Policy Space Response Oracles. Um, and essentially the way this works is, well, there's three main steps. You're gonna have a population of agents that's shown here in purple. Um, you're gonna select some opponent and we're gonna use this, uh, do this using this function Q. So let's say Q is a function that helps us select some opponents from our population. Now our agent, which we're training, which is this pink one, is gonna train against those uh, uh, selected opponents until it's very good. Um, and we, we deem it as strong enough. Um, and then once it's uh, strong, we can decide to add it to the population or not and grow the population or, or, or there's different options, but usually it's, it's added back into the population. There are three kind of natural questions, given that there's these three steps <laughs> that one could ask. Uh, the first one is, okay, we have this population. How do we select the opponents? Um, that's this function Q over here. Uh, you could also ask, how do we train? Like, uh, we have our opponents. Now, how do we make the most out of, uh, of them for, uh, for training our agent? And then finally, how do we decide whether we put it back into the population or how do we integrate this new knowledge? Um, I'm going to focus mostly on the first, or well, solely on the first question of how do we select opponents? Mostly because, well, how do we train could arguably be answered almost with like more classical RL methods of how to train an agent. Um, and then in terms of how do we decide which to keep, well, let's just assume for now we're just adding them all always onto the new population. So that's maybe not something uh, that worst case we can just do that for now. Um, so I guess the question if we focus on in how do we select these opponents? And it might seem like silly because you do have a population. So here we go, that's all, just train against all of them maybe. But actually it's more important than that, right? Like the quality of whatever our agent ends up learning really depends on the opponents. Whatever our agent learns will be a function of what opponent we've given it, right? 
Um, so essentially, actually, if you can think of many of the algorithms that we now have around multi-agent training and or PSR related as just different Q functions, different ways of choosing, well, Q functions might be confusing in our else, but uh, different Q there, different ways of selecting opponents. Um, and that's what it almost boils down to. So the different choices of your opponents from your population give you what we consider nowadays very different algorithms, but actually often they just boil down to exactly this question. And this was also basically the main part of my research is thinking exactly about this. Um, and I'll come a bit later to what we did exactly around um, this type of uh, opponent selection. Um, so the way PSRO goes, as I mentioned, is you, you start with an agent, um, and then uh, you train your agent against that whatever you have so far. And once that, that one is strong enough, you keep growing it. So P1 would have one agent, P2 would have these two, and so on. The population just keeps growing at every time step. And then whatever current agent you have is going to have access to the previous population so far, including itself often. Um, yeah, but it doesn't have to play around against all of those. Um, so as I mentioned, um, this Q uh, is going to be it's what we're calling this function to choose which one to play uh, from from our from our uh, set of um, agents. So we are going to have as many cues in here. Each cue is going to indicate the probability of choosing someone from that uh, from that population, um, and we're going to have a probability for each of the agents in that population. So when it's the pink guy's turn to be trained, this vector describes what the probability is of choosing each of the people in that population like, as one of its opponents at all iterations of training. Um, and bear in mind that also the, the agent itself can be his own opponent as well. Um, so maybe to make this a bit more clear, uh, if you're thinking about, if, for example, independent RL, right, could be, for, could be viewed through this framework. Obviously, this is an overkill because we wouldn't need this whole population. But you could imagine independent RL is just that agent playing against itself, right? So you would just really train, training this guy against itself. That's usually what uh, self-play, that's how self-play is often done. In this case, as I said, obviously the population is not necessary because you only have the agent training against itself. Um, iterated best response, in case some of you have heard of it, um, what you do here is you only train against the previous one, right? So the hope is that every agent keeps increasingly being better. Um, so if you only play against the last one, you're always getting better and better. Um, as you might imagine, this is very good for translative games. So if there is a very clear axis along which to improve, this is great because you then show that you're getting better with every time. Obviously not as great with cycles because you might get stuck in a cycle. If you only care about the last uh, agent that came, you basically forget all the history before that, right? So this is only really great for translative games. Um, there's fictitious set play, uh, which can be phrased in this framework is essentially like having exactly this, but you have a uniform distribution uh, over who you're playing from your uh, from from the population, including yourself. So you just add training. You choose one of the opponents from the population at random, and 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 this for every episode essentially. Um, there are a number of different ones. I'm not going to go into all of them. As you can see, this one is called deep cognitive hierarchies, and they, they their complexity can vary a lot. So this one is a bit more complex, where you have different number of players and levels and then players on different levels sample from the previous level and you can have like really complex like setups of how you're choosing whom to play against. Um, this one I thought I mentioned because there's some results later on as well, but just to show as well that really people have thought about this type of structure and what's the best way of choosing who to train against. Um, as I mentioned, I mentioned earlier fictitious self-play, which I'm sure you, some of you might have heard the name at least, um, assumes this uniform sampling across possible opponents. Um, and what you might argue, and, and it is true, is that essentially you might waste it because you're choosing uniformly, you might actually waste a lot of energy. Firstly, because some opponents might be very easy. So if maybe at the beginning, agents were not really trained, you might not want to waste time training against those. You're already better than that. Um, maybe you're wasting time on two hard opponents. So it's also not clear. There's no notion of finding the best opponent that matches your skill level. And um, so the natural question is, can we do better than uniform? Um, and essentially, what uh, the next methods that I'm going to talk about 
they change this Q as a function of the performance of the agent. So, so far, and this is why I wrote up here, so far we've had this fixed Q, like all these vectors were always fixed through training, but you could imagine having also um, a varying Q, right? A Q that adapts to what the current performance is, and you essentially choose who you're playing against depending on how well you're doing against the entire population. Um, some examples of a varying uh, queue is, for example, the extension to fictitious self-play, which is called prioritized fictitious self-play, um, where, and this looks daunting because there's a lot of letters, but it's actually not that much. You look at the queue is just for each of the agents, so the probability with which you choose each of the agents is just going to be a function of whether you're beating it or not. That's all of this is saying, and then we we'll normalize it. But essentially, all that this is saying is depending on, uh, on, on how well you do against an agent in the population, do I choose them as my opponent or not. Um, and there is this F here. What I find really cool is that there is this, this function. So this will be a function of our performance. And this function, all that is asked of it is that it is some weighing function that maps from the space from between zero and one to between zero and infinity, basically. So it gives a weight to that agent. Um, and uh, depending on how you choose this function, you can have a very different effect on how you are choosing your, uh, your opponent. So if you choose this for the function, for example, so one minus x, b, x, b, uh, um, what you get is this function over here, which essentially intuitively basically says you are training against those that beat you. So you are prioritizing those that are stronger than you. Yeah, you can see it here in, in, in that tail. Um, however, if you pick a different form for the function, you're actually prioritizing those. This one here, for example, you're prioritizing those that are approximately your level. So you're here in the middle, 50-50 chance against beating them. So you're choosing for opponents that are more or less your level, which is really cool by just the different choice of F. Um, and it was shown that this is uh, very effective. Uh, this is a plot from the Alpha Star paper. You can see um, that uh, the best combination was exactly this prioritized fictitious self-play with actually self-play, so it was a combination of both. Um, self-play actually gets you a long way, which is interesting. Um, but in terms of robustness, and there's a separate plot in the paper, you can see that this one here is not only the best, but then also significantly more robust, these type of methods. Um, so that was interesting to see as well. Um, there is also uh, another type of varying Q function, which essentially uh, takes into account the Nash. So um, you can imagine if at all times you take your current population, you just have a payoff between all the agents in your populations against all other agents in that same population. Um, and then if you look at the Nash, you can say, okay, whatever agent I'm training, I want it to train according to however much weight someone has in the Nash. So this assuming that agents with a lot of weight in the Nash, again, are stronger agents that the population would put forward. Um, it does have the downside in that if there are some cycles in the game, sometimes these populations get, can get stuck um, because you are essentially always focusing on, um, yeah, on, if, on whoever has coverage within that cycle. So there is that potential downside, but it is another way of picking up who are the strong opponents in this population that I can play against. Um, here's a nice comparison uh, from Mark's paper a while ago. Um, comparing these different methods, so we have fictitious self-play, uh, double oracle, and the deep cognitive hierarchies, which is this very complex looking one that I showed earlier. And you can see they're all somewhat comparable in terms of their exploitability, so you'd like it to be as low as possible. Um, some seem more robust than other, but I think the main takeaway is that just how you decide to choose your, um, your opponents makes a huge difference. You can see to exploitability, but also to your training. Is there a question? Sorry, what? Oh, hi. Yeah, hi, Franz. Hi. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'll, I'll ask, why can it get stuck? Sorry, can, let me try to get that now in the wrong window. Da, 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 da. Yes. Um, so, uh, if there are cycles, I know. What I observed when I was training these type of populations is that um, mm, 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 mm. somehow it would overfocus. So if there was a cyclic component, it might you might always end up. Mm, okay, I'm trying to think back how I was phrasing this when I when I essentially because you always have these three main opponents, you you have these in rock paper scissors. Imagine you get all of rock paper scissors, and then you might be stuck in the middle with some blah middle bit. So you're choosing 
three strong ones and then the agent gets stuck between not knowing which one to get stuck in that cycle basically but i think so this is somewhat thing that is a bit unavoidable and i'll say a little bit about that in a moment when you have someone training if there is a cycle nash with the nash distribution will pick everyone who is on that cycle who is strong and then you might just get stuck moving against those in a cycle but not actually learn either of those well okay i'll say something in a second and then hi yeah steven and i'll um but the uh, the point of that is that once you've expanded the whole cycle then then the nash uh over those should mm -hmm. be the nash of the game so you should be good yeah okay let me come circle back to that one yeah i think yeah thanks for clarifying i think that makes sense hmm. i'm trying to think why i wrote the fact that they there was something there i'll come back to that <laughs> thank you um yeah, sorry. So just in this one to say that um, the behavior of the game changes completely. Like the learning dynamics, the output, the, um, the resulting population, everything that we get can change a lot just from how you choose your different opponents. And we can see the different curves for the different methods here. Um, uh, finally, another way that is related to, this, uh, to the Nash one um, is the, this rectified Nash where um, essentially it's similar to the Nash, but what we're doing, what you're doing is only play everyone who's in the Nash that you're already beating. And I think this, this goes back to the comment I made earlier. This is an old slide. Um, essentially here you are playing against strong opponents, but uh, only the ones that you already have a positive win rate against. Now, this might seem a bit counterintuitive, but the motivation about for this was that it allows you to specialize. So um, if you are a, if you have, imagine rock, paper, scissors, where you can have, get stronger and stronger rock, paper, scissors as well. So it's a mix of transitive and non-transitive. You would have, um, by spe it would allow you to specialize. So if you are focused on paper because you're beating paper, then all of a sudden you'd be becoming a stronger and stronger scissor. So you wouldn't be stuck in that. That's, I think this is how I, it's a dangerous way of putting it, I agree. Uh, but you wouldn't get, if you at every time can only add one agent to your population, um, so you train, train, train until some sort of convergence and then add that to the population. Um, in this particular case with rectified NAS, the motivation was that it would allow it to specialize and we would have a strong one that doesn't cycle. Whereas if you just take the NASH, you might be just cycling. If there's a cycle in the NASH, you might, your agent might just either cycle between those and not really get better in any of the transitive dimensions along there. That's going back to that, but I agree that it is a bit unfortunately said. So maybe I'll think about rephrasing that one. Um, and in this paper that uh, also for that we did with Dave a while back, um, we measured the relative population performance um, against uh, in the two games that are known to have these non transitivities. Um, and in this particular uh, case, so um, we uh, basically okay. These curves are a bit difficult to read, but essentially you're showing the performance of our algorithm doing this rectified Nash against either self-play, FSP, or double Oracle. So the better it is, the, the higher, if it's above zero, it is better to use rectified Nash, which is the case, especially for self-play, which is not particularly good. So in that case, we are easier at beating it. Whereas with uh, fictitious self-play and double Oracle and Colonel Blotto, they more or less do as well as we do. But um, in, uh, in differentiable lotto, actually, it is clearly better to actually specialize using rectified Nash as well. Um, cool. And then finally, um, some of the research that I worked on, and that's uh, some of the, the stuff that I led just quickly to mention as well, was moving away from this notion of growing your population one agent at a time um, by just training a single agent and then keeping that one fixed and putting in the population and it never gets updated again to can we think about training populations all at the same time continuously? So everyone in the population is training. Um, it might make it harder because you have a lot of moving targets, um, but at the same time, it might allow you to explore uh, um, a bit more efficiently because everyone is exploring at the same time. Um, and if you have restrictions on your population size, then something like this would also help. So you could grow that population jointly. Um, and the, the, the question essentially, um, around my main question on research was um, if we look at this, let me go back to this one actually. Um, if you imagine of the population like this as a graph where each of the edges indicates whether you're playing with against someone or not during training, um, if we think about uh, like uniform training, like PSRO, the normal, when we're just uniformly sampling against everyone, 
um, we just have it just everyone to ever run essentially or to all the previous ones that came. Um, and I remember sitting in one of the meetings back in the day when we were doing a, a research on, on when Starcraft was starting and they had these populations and they were training everyone against everyone. And, I, and, and then it, we were frustrated that we didn't have a lot of diversity in the strategies. And I thought, yes, but the object, the objective for everyone in that population is the same because everyone is just training against everyone else. Um, some of the intuition behind that turned out to be right. <laughs> some uh, I, I had to rethink. Um, but essentially, this was the starting point for that, where we think, okay, can we think about who to train against in real time as a graph? And can we just describe these different interactions? So we came up with a few graphs, like everyone against everyone, that's this one, or self blame would be drawn as a graph like this, where every agent is just playing themselves. Um, you could explicitly build in cycles, right? So what this one here is saying is this agent only cares about beating this one, but doesn't care about losing to anyone else, right? Um, why might you want cycles? Well, if you know that your game is cyclic, then maybe encoding this allows agents to specialize because uh, you don't want to be the best. You want to be the best at beating someone specific. And then this can allow you to actually have specializations within, within the population as well. We tried out different hierarchical graphs, PSRO as a graph. Um, we also tried some of the, um, these varying cues where it's a function of your payoff. So play only those that are better than you. Play only those that are worse than you. Um, Rectifies version of that. Um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, um, but just maybe to point out that you get very, very, very different learning behavior from just choosing your opponents differently. So what you're seeing here, again, without going into a lot of detail, is some sort of rock, paper, scissors with some transitive element as well. Those are these three blocks. And these lines are the trajectories of the agents learning over time. So we have four agents. These lines are the trajectories, how they change, how they, what their policy is at each time during training. And the, the blobs are just the final point. And you can see that some just spend their time cycling around from mode to mode of rock, paper, scissors. Some actually converge on the different modes, which is great. Some just lose their mind. Um, so there's a little bit of everything. And this is just a function of how you choose your opponent, right? So this was quite an exploratory paper. And there, we, there's still a lot that we don't know. Um, but uh, and, and this was very much experimental heuristic. Let's try different graphs out. But, uh, it was already clear from this, this is uh, quite, uh, seems to be quite influential for training agents. So like we maybe should think about who we're choosing to play against. Um, we also looked at the diversity. So if, what does the diversity, not only what does the performance look like, but how does the performance affect diversity? And in general, we saw that more diverse uh, populations were usually also better performing because we had you on sensitivity. Um, and we observed how different graphs led to different performance uh, um, and different diversities and kind of thought a little bit about that. And that's a paper that we recently published at a conference and it's also now an archive. Um, so it was really interesting to just play around with a lot of these things. Uh, there's not a lot of papers where you train whole populations at once, I think, because there's a lot of moving costs. People are a bit uh, intimidated, but uh, it was a lot of fun to this work. Um, so in terms of going back, maybe summarizing what, what, what we mentioned, uh, there is, uh, in terms of individual rating, how does one go about uh, rating the agents, a single agent in a population? Uh, we have talked a little bit about different rate, uh, rating and ranking methods, such as ELOs and extensions of ELOs that have these different properties. Um, in terms of population rating, um, I mentioned these two metrics. We have the relative population performance and the effective diversity. Um, and finally, for population training, uh, I just covered a few of the methods um, that we can basically classify of different ways of choosing your opponents uh, from growing populations. We can also think about how we choose our opponents in a fixed size population, and when several of those are training. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting questions there. There's a lot of not, things that are not very clear, um, but this is more or less what we were thinking about um, over the last years. Yeah, and I think that's my last slide. Thanks a lot, everyone. <laughs> so I think, do we? Uh, how much time do we have for Q and A? I think uh, uh, certainly uh, five minutes, and uh, uh, if questions come in, we we can take a little bit longer. I think, but. Let's see.
Friends, I think you had the uh, the first question. Yeah, I want to make sure that there's at least one question there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does any other anyone else with a question? Uh, it's perfectly fine to to prioritize uh, that over mine. I think uh, there's one in the the chat. The uh, Voshtek uh, Vark, if I'm pronouncing that right. Mm, basically, yeah, but that's not a question. It actually says it's not a question. Just oh, a comment sorry. on the error list. Yeah, just that. Um, yes, I, I guess uh, right now the uh, the only one in the Q and A is uh, uh, Francis' question on um, there. Francis, you want to? Uh... Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so, so I guess my my question uh, uh, is the following. Uh, so this. Uh, sort of general approach of trying to optimize uh, uh, populations goes back, uh, you know, already quite some time. I think the field of co-evolution uh, revolved uh, uh, pretty much uh, all around this. Uh, and uh, there were these uh, approaches like the Nash memory, uh, or something that already, you know, tried to do uh, some of these things. So I guess now in recent years, we've I investigated many different variants, and you presented, uh, uh, you know, quite quite a lot of them. So now, what, in your opinion, are really the, the key kind of like uh, uh, variants, or the key techniques that, you know, are really enabling us to, uh, you know, better deal with these problems? Mm -hmm. out, out of all, all the different things that you presented, you know, what, what, which ones do you think are the most promising, I guess? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. And I think I'm going to use a cop out <laughs> that says, um, I think it's incredibly game dependent. And I think this is something that we observed as well. When basically when we were doing a lot of the tests on these um, uh, different interaction graphs, we, um, we tried them all in like really cute little games and like the typical game theory games that one tries. And, it, and we had some notion of like, yeah, this is it. These are the good graphs. This is what you need. You need this type of cycle. And then uh, we just ran some of those on StarCraft and basically nothing held or like a lot of things were inverted. Um, so I think that a lot of this depends really on what your game looks like. In, 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 and, and really, it's, it's as much as it sucks, I think it is really a function of, yeah, what's your game? It's your game state, but you have lots of cycles. What is your transitive dimension? It's like how complex is your game, right? So, I, and and this is why something that might seem as simple and doesn't do really well, like self play, in all of these little experiments, game theoretic ones, never does this well. But actually, on StarCraft, was one of the strongest one as well because it gets you there quickly. Um, so, I think it's it's hard to, it's hard to say. I'd say uh, I think the best way would be to try to to be aware that this is a, something that will affect learning. And to try to understand first, maybe a good first step is try to understand your gamescape before you make any fixed choices, right? Um, we also had experiments that if you know the underlying graph structure of your game, so if you know it's a cycle with three elements, or if you know there's a certain hierarchical structure, if you then choose a graph that matches that, of course, you're going to do much better because you're giving them already that structure, right? So maybe trying to understand your game structure a little bit before you apply it, in general, obviously, work, would work well. Otherwise, I'd say rather don't impose too much structure rather than imposing the wrong one, if that makes sense. So don't go too fixed. Uh, so okay. anyway, yeah. And so, so, so then, because uh, that's actually quite a compelling answer, I think, that, 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 that you give, where, and, and, and to some extent, this also makes it interesting if it's so game dependent. But then what is somehow the research agenda moving forward now? Mm -hmm. um, could you comment on that? That's a great question. <laughs> so um, I think what one can maybe, there, there's two questions. It's firstly, how can we understand this game landscape, which I think I know very little about other than now these intuitions that I gained through this. Um, I think in general, methods that are more adaptive, so anywhere where the cube is actually a function of performance or something gives you the extra leverage that you can adapt. So you're not going to be stuck with the wrong graph the wrong structure or limited by that. It, it obviously, it's a bit of, the, it's the same problem, right? You're giving ex extra expressional power, you're giving the, 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 the population the ability to choose this, but at the same time, this then also is an extra thing that you have to learn. So I think in general, that's where it might be worth investing more. Can we find algorithms that as a function of how well your agents are doing, find these graphs themselves, rather than these very static, which I think helped initially for us to wrap our head around like, how do populations grow? 
how do we choose agents and whatnot? So I think we'll move more towards that, but it's not trivial to me like how one would go about that, if that makes sense. So, so a, a, a form of auto-moral. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> great, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Franz. And I think if we have time, we have a few more uh, a few more questions. I don't think we can get uh, I don't think uh, we can get through all of them. But um, one the uh, one of the first ones, uh, just a clarification qu question from uh, uh, Kevin Wong. Then uh, I, I had the same question on, on one of the on the slide on the slide on your recent paper. Um, you had some figures of uh, uh, showing essentially the effects of, of different um, uh, interaction graphs, and uh, Kevin was asking what. Um, mm -hmm. What the circle, what the circles yeah, on those graphs yeah, yeah, represent, yeah. and the... that's a great question. Sorry, this is a, a weird game that I came up with that is uh, not the easiest to explain. In my head, it was, and then it turned out to be a nightmare to explain to everyone. Um, essentially, the Nash, because it is rock paper scissors, the Nash is either 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 of those uh, of the rock paper scissors. As, as, as with rock paper scissors, you have either rock paper scissors or the center is also a Nash, right? Because then you cannot get better. So all those four points, the middle would also have been a Nash. Yes. To answer the question, all of those four. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so you're, uh, you're saying that the, the figures are actually you're seeing trajectories in the strategy space itself. Yeah. I understand yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. And then basically you are just uh, let me go back. So the center would be either of those four essentially are strong, and then basically all that is adding is some sort of transitive dimension. So there is a stronger rock, a stronger paper, a stronger scissor. So if you go here, you become weaker as a rock. If this is rock. Um, so you want to be on top of this. This is like three holes and you want to be on the top of the hall or in the middle where no one can beat you because you're just completely agnostic to any choice of, of, of rock, paper, scissors. But yeah, it's not the most intuitive of games, so apologies. <laughs> I think there were a couple of questions that, that, that um, maybe it's easier to answer all, all at once. Uh, uh, someone asked about um, non-zero sum games. Someone asked about uh, uh, more, than, uh, more than two players. Uh-huh, uh-huh, okay, um, that's a good question. So, I mean, uh, those fixed methods that don't affect anything in terms of like zero sum or non-zero sum because you're just saying who you're training against, that, that, that's fine, they're fixed, right, how you choose someone. Um, it starts getting more interesting once it is a function of your performance, and I guess you would have to take that into account. Um, but even that is still relative. So even if it's not zero sum, I would imagine that some would still hold. Where all of this breaks down more is in the notion of evaluating. So these two methods that we had, like the, the effective diversity and the relative population performance, they both hinge on the fact that it has to be two players zero sum. Uh, I think constant sum might work, but beyond that, we're, we're, it doesn't work, right? So we would have to very rightly point it out, come up with new ways of evaluating these type of games. Uh, in, in evaluation that so that i think that's what would break down more to answer your question less so the choice of opponents because i think there we can still get some signal from the fact that someone is better or worse than us if that makes sense i think that that covers those uh those comments um i think there, there were just a couple more questions uh uh vahid had um a question on uh, let's see so if you, ha if you have pairs of agents that if you have some pairs of agents that are training while others are uh uh, waiting, how would that affect um, the, uh, the learning dynamics? Um. Mm -hmm. um, so the way that works, the one where you're growing the population, so not the station, not the, um, but the, the growing one, usually what happens is that the rest, the ones that are fixed that you have in storage, those are not trained anymore. So you're always only training one more, does that make sense? Which actually makes the dynamics much, much easier. It makes it easier in that you have a fixed thing and then this one is just training against this target that might change depending on who you choose, but it's still, these ones are all fixed, right? Whereas in the other one with the with the graphs, everyone was training, so you have these moving targets, which is a whole different can of worms, um, if that makes sense. And let's see, I think there was one more in the Q&A. Uh, let's see, Stephen McCaller, um, I think you were asking about uh, uh, which um in, in the uh, in this in the slide that's up uh, up now which i, I think which um uh, of these graphs are actually uh or mm -hmm. if any of these graphs are guaranteed to converge to the um the equilibrium of a uh, two player zero sum game yeah. and why should we train yeah that, that's a great question so I, I, what i'll say to that is we have no guarantee of anything so none of this is guaranteed so um 
that's why we would train with graphs that are not guaranteed because we don't know whether there's we have no way of telling um in general um as i meant this goes back to what i was mentioning earlier you have to figure these things out with things that are as simple as this one over here where you have um we know the underlying uh, graph of this game because it is this rock paper scissors with these we can actually choose which one is going to be the um which one's going to be the graph that's going to get us there which is this one because it has exactly the game structure there again it, there's no guarantees but it is very likely going to lead us there however had we not known that this is the underlying game structure there's no way for us to know which one's going to work right and this goes back to what uh, i was chatting to france about we need to understand what our game looks like as the more we understand it the better we can adapt our training methods for it and it's going to be very game it's it's very hard to make generalizing statements around what is going to work for one game versus the other let alone with guarantees unfortunately i think uh friends you you the, the one last uh, i think it's all the the questions from the audience we've got so far but friends you had one last uh, comment slash question yeah, yeah. So, so, so I, I didn't completely follow. Uh, I guess the the comment by you, Marta, where you said for for non-zero sum games, or well, something wouldn't work. And I wasn't ex exactly sure what the something was that you were referring yeah, to. Yeah. So, like you say, I think something like double oracle and Nash should work because it is it is still your relative performance against others. What wouldn't work um, is these uh, performance measures that I mentioned. So the relative per population performance and the, the the effective diversity, because those the way they're currently calculated, account expect that you are that there is this uh, this uh, the way the payoff is that the payoff that we are taking the absolute value thereby scraping whatever is negative, which means it's worse than you. So there's a lot of assumptions around how that is calculated that wouldn't translate to non-zero sum game for the evaluation metric. But it, it, this is a separate point. I think these methods for training, they don't necessarily rely on that. Some do, but not all of them do. And then they, those that don't, as you pointed out, PSR also works, obviously. Yeah, yeah. So I, I see. So, so, so what, what you're saying is if you have these kind of metrics, um, you know, they might not converge in, in, in some kind of clear fashion. But as long as, uh, indeed, uh, you're kind of guaranteed to have a non-zero probability of finding a better response if one exists and incorporating this into the mixture, uh, in, in the end, these kind of like uh, archive type of methods should still work, right? Exactly, yeah. Whereas, whereas these other evaluation methods, so going away from the training, just evaluating, those become meaningless. Like whatever we're using right now, that doesn't mean anything anymore because they are under the assumption that it is a zero sum. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so let's see, I don't see any other questions in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, do, do you have time for any more uh, any more questions or? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, see, <laughs> any, uh, well, people are, th are thinking of any uh, uh, final questions. I, I did have one question on, um, um, as I said, so there, there was a paper, I believe it was at DeepMind on the, uh, uh, the real games look like spinning tops. Ah, um, mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of the, uh, in several of the result slides, it was showing that, you know, self-play actually does really well. And I was wondering if maybe there's a risk with methods that really focus on population-based training and, mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, and finding diverse populations. If there's a risk that they can get, I think you were kind of hinting, hinting at this before that there's a risk that they get stuck essentially trying to explore that, uh, uh, that intransitive, that really large intransitive component, mm -hmm. ignoring the fact that there is a transitive dimension they can move in. So yeah. you get you get improvements along that intransitive dimension, you're moving along that cycle without ever actually getting finding a better solution. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and uh, so essentially, and, and that's a great point. Actually, so what that paper says, I think, because I wanted to watch butcher it, <laughs> is that uh, the more if the more you increase on the on the your performance, the fewer and fewer cycles you're going to have. So the top agents are actually the, the, the top. Of, of, of as you go up the performance is fairly transitive versus once you're if you, we draw it along this axis performance that's why it's called spinning top and then as you get worse and worse you actually have more and more cycles that that, that go in this um and that is for sure this is why I, I generally i also think that you do you should try to not get stuck in these cycles as you say and really push along the transitive uh, uh dimension it's also some this is where it helps to understand the game as well um, but sometimes, yeah, it's not clear 
again, the gamescape, I think, is not as trivial as like there's one direction and there's a cycle, right? Sometimes you cannot even get to first to be able to optimize on some transitive dimension. You need to first be part of some cycle or overcome that. So it's it's all not very, it's very unclear, the long story short, I think. And then this is why I do norm generally advocate for those that are a bit more flexible and adapting because you can then, these can still collapse to something that is very much transitive, right? If you do something as a function of your performance, you could still then choose to only play against the last one if the whole cycle isn't relevant anymore for you, right? Um, whereas if you have these fixed ones, you might be stuck in, like you say, actually like exploring cycles where there is no interest in doing that anymore. So yeah, just some generalizing statements. <laughs> I think that definitely, uh... <laughs> That definitely answers my uh, my question. Um, so let's see, I don't see anything else in Q and A or in chat. Um, to uh, there are no more um, uh, no more questions. Uh, do you want to give, give another uh, round of applause and, uh, and wrap up? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks, Mark. That was great. Thank Very you. nice overview.